two police officers in blue uniforms pulled up to my garage in a patrol car. Stealthily, I observed them from my hiding spot beneath the lift. It was odd to witness police officers in high spirits, but as they approached, their demeanor turned serious. Confirming my identity, they delivered unfortunate news about my wife. Something had occurred at her home and she was now in the hospital. However, they couldn't provide details. In an attempt to leave, they intercepted me seeking explanations. They inquired about my whereabouts for the last three hours. I reassured them that I had been at the garage all day, suggesting they ask my two mechanics for confirmation. I reluctantly admitted that I had briefly left around 11 a.m. to grab coffee for all of us. While one officer chatted with Mike and Pete, the other noted the coffee shop I visited when asked if they could see my car. I agreed without hesitation leading him to my truck parked outside. He thoroughly inspected it before granting permission to go to the hospital. Upon arriving at the hospital, the same two officers intercepted me again for more answers. We headed to the hospital cafeteria for much needed coffee. They probed into my relationship with my wife. I explained that we had met and married relatively late around eight years ago. Kate had successfully worked as an attorney but quit her job a month ago to take a break before pregnancy. I expressed my love for her emphasizing that we were doing well and looking forward to starting a family. When asked about John Barton, I denied knowing him and they walked away without providing any answers. Trusting my team to secure the garage, I headed straight home. Two forensic scientists and a detective were searching the house, the detective introduced himself explained what he knew and posed the same questions as the previous officers along with a new one about some drops of blood in the downstairs toil I claimed ignorance and sought assurance that they were actively investigating other possibilities. The detective reassured me mentioning his colleague talking to Mrs. Barden. Curious about John Barden, I asked but the detective deemed it inappropriate to comment. They left me in a state of confusion. Entering the master bedroom, I witnessed a scene that would have truly shocked me if I were watching it for the first time. Earlier that day, around 10 a.m. at work, thoughts about intimacy had crossed my mind. It wasn't unusual. They say guys think about closeness an average of 67 times per waking hour. Since Kate left her job, our intimate moments, which used to be two to three times a week, had dwindled to almost zero. She seemed preoccupied, bored, and tired. I attributed it to her fear of impending changes with the arrival of children, reflecting on our early years of marriage where our intimacy was spontaneous and frequent I snapped back to reality. I decided to act to restore spontaneity and connection with Kate after informing Mick and Pete about my temporary absence I returned home with the intention of spending quality time with her. However, my plans were shattered when I saw an unfamiliar car in the driveway. Despite the unexpected visitor, I decided to enter the house hoping to salvage my plans without raising suspicion. Opening the front door my world crumbled as I heard unmistakable sounds of joyous affinity echoing down the stairs. Suppressing the urge to react violently, I turned away. It was undoubtedly the most challenging moment of my life. Evastated, I collapsed outside the bedroom door dimly aware of their betrayal. I couldn't determine how long I stayed there when the sound ceased replaced only by conversations. I realized I needed to think trying to avoid emotional distractions. I devised a plan. My military skills from two years ago provided the perfect shock weapon, a stun grenade designed for hostage rescue. Fueled by newfound hatred, I quickly implemented the plan hoping to avoid a trial. Upstairs, I discreetly placed the device its flash in sound meant to stun for seconds with a looped rope around the light fixture. Pulling out the pin, I exited the room covering my ears. The subsequent explosion was intense and following the plan, I re-entered the room prepared for action. To my surprise, the scene was not as expected. Mr. Onus lay on the bed displaying clear damage below the waist while Kate lay on the floor seemingly confused. Retreating to the hall, I pondered my next steps. Two horrifying screams emanated from the bedroom signaling trouble. My plan had failed in peeking into the chaotic scene, I realized the guy was in pain and Kate was absent presumably in the bathroom. Desperate to erase any evidence I located the detonator and added it to the rope. 
I disposed of anything else that might incriminate me, speaking down the street, I emptied my pockets into a roadside trash can. Back in my garage, I called Mick and Pete explaining the situation, their initial shock turned into laughter as they realized the absurdity of the events. They agreed to vouch for my alibi, and we spent the next hour laughing in disbelief. The following days were filled with disappointment as reporters besieged my quiet street. The hospital administrator informed me of Kate's request for pajamas. Despite the circumstances, I sent them to the hospital. Kate's father called apologizing for his daughter's behavior and expressing hope for continued communication. He reminded me that he had another daughter recently divorced, but the situation felt too bizarre. A few days later, Mr. Not So Big Deal was released from the hospital exposed as a serial cheater. His reconstructed manhood was unlikely to function as intended. Sarah Barton, his wife, visited me seeking evidence for her divorce case playing her the aftermath of the explosion. She left without much sadness. The detective appearing informally visited me and suggested closing the case due to insufficient evidence. With a smile, I wished him well. Kate's letter arrived expressing shame and regret. She understood the gravity of her actions and accept the consequences. The letter touched me deeply, and I reversed my decision to send her pajamas, reflecting on the entire ordeal I received unexpected visitors Sarah Barton, and the detective. Sarah sought evidence for her divorce case and the detective now off-duty inquired about the events. I maintained my silence, leaving them with unanswered questions. In the end, I received closure from Kate's letter understanding the extent of her remorse. The pain was still fresh, but I found solace in knowing that I wasn't to blame for her actions. As life continued, I focused on rebuilding and rediscovering happiness free from the shackles of betrayal. I'm seeking advice, feeling a bit lost without anyone to turn to. I just want guidance on how to move forward in my situation. My wife and I have been together for a decade, married for three, and were parents to three daughters. I worked full time while she's a stay at home mom. We're both in our early 30s and we own a house. Overall, our marriage is good, but financial struggles with a single income have been a constant issue. Around nine days ago, something unexpected came up while in bed. My wife brought up the idea of bringing others into our bedroom. We had discussed it before, and I was open to experimenting if the conditions were right. However, she surprised me by suggesting my close friend, let's call him Jake. Jake has an open relationship with his wife and openly talks about group sex. This threw me off because Jake and I have been close friends for over 15 years, even playing in a band together in college. Despite my reservations, my wife insisted that involving Jake could be okay. We engaged in some dirty talk about the possibility and had sex afterward. I couldn't shake off some uneasy feelings, suspecting that she had discussed the idea with Jake before bringing it up with me. I know it's not ideal but feeling a bit paranoid. I checked her phone. We've never had strict privacy policy and our phones were usually accessible. To my surprise, I found a deleted conversation in the trash folder. It contained about 60 messages between my wife and Jake starting from the F. They discussed Jake's relationship with his wife admitting to having thought about sleeping with each other. The conversation escalated into explicit discussions about meeting up and having sex with plans for her to visit him the next day while I was at work and the kids were at school. Confronting my wife, she admitted to everything. While at Jake's house, they talked, kissed, undressed, and engaged in sexual activities, but it stopped when she began crying. She expressed remorse claiming it was a mistake and that she planned to tell me everything the next day. Evastated, I left and stayed with a friend for a few days. Her mother came to support her and the kids. Upon my return, my wife explained that her actions were driven by a sudden spike in libido after a prolonged period of low libido due to medication and the challenges of raising kids at home. She mentioned. Trail, I still love my wife and want to salvage our family. We've decided to pursue therapy. I'm reaching out to anyone who has faced a similar situation for advice on forgiveness and rebuilding trust. 
I want to hear about experiences and learn what steps others have taken to move forward in such circumstances. I thought I'd be the first one at the lawyer's office, but when I and my lawyer arrived, Dave and his lawyer were already in the conference room. Seeing him with an attractive woman triggered my usual jealous reaction making me feel somewhat inferior. At 48, he was more handsome than ever tall and muscular, running a successful business, and leading the local chamber of commerce. My MD flared up, especially when I noticed Dave barely acknowledging me. The red-haired lawyer's reassuring gesture heightened my anxiety, and I couldn't help but interpret it as her trying to finish the meeting quickly to pursue him. I knew from experience that she would enjoy it given my husband's charm. Dave's indifference frustrated me, but I had to focus on the meeting while my lawyer chatted with the red-haired one. As I sat down, Dave took a folder from my purse, opened it, and laid out the finished script. His faint smile hinted that he was aware of my thorough preparation. The meeting began, and I tried to appeal to Dave's emotions, emphasizing the importance of listening to Mrs. Julian Brown for at least an hour. The ticking timer accentuated the silence, and I couldn't help but feel annoyed that Dave insisted on lawyers being present. I had to share my feelings in front of strangers making this situation even more humiliating, but dwelling on the negatives wouldn't help. I had to stick to the script crossing my fingers and recalling my friend Sonia's advice. Clearing my throat, I expressed gratitude for Dave's willingness to meet acknowledged my error and clarified it was about my self-centeredness, not his failure. I had spent days reflecting and hoped he would appreciate my honesty. My speech aimed to offer the justification he needed, contemplating the potential consequences if the kids were at home. I considered playing the Dave, you can't break up the family card. I observed his reactions examining his face. To my surprise, Dave remained neutral raising his pen and marking a check next to the first sentence in his notes. My confidence wavered as I realized I had played into his expectations. I spoke about being lost without children feeling aged unattractive and worthless. I confessed to meeting Jason during church committee collaborations, describing him as a skilled seducer who knew how to press the right buttons. I admitted to the temptation, but proudly shared that I declined Jason's proposition four months ago. Tears welled up as I recounted the shameful night, apologizing, and expressing regret for not breaking up with Jason earlier. The details flowed revealing a night of weakness, too much wine, and a blurred line of consent. Dave said an impasse I've face haunted me as I described the events in Megan's old room. The shame intensified when I admitted I had composed myself enough to make Jason use action. My confession hung in the air, but Dave's reaction remained unreadable. The revelation that Dave had an audio recording of that night hit me like a ton of bricks I couldn't fathom why he needed a voice recorder unless he knew he could record something incriminating. The meeting became a battleground of conflicting emotion my attempts to salvage the situation crumbling. I shifted my strategy focusing on vague statements and avoiding unnecessary details. I admitted Jason's seduction emphasizing his pursuit and my momentary weakness. I hoped to convince Dave that it was a one-time mistake, not a pattern. As the video clips played, I witnessed the unraveling of my lies and rationalizations. Dave orchestrating a silent symphony of separation didn't utter a word. The gravity of the situation intensified when I realized he was playing video clips, not just audio recordings. The final blow came with a damning video of Jay wife threatening consequences. My attempts to convey positive messages fell flat and the alarm clock signaled the end of my futile efforts. I signed the divorce papers acknowledging the loss of my old life and the consequences of my actions. The recordings exposed the depth of my trail and as I left the room, I couldn't face safe. The shame, humiliation, and the weight of my mistakes pressed heavily on me. I contemplated my future hoping my children would still love me unconditionally despite the wreckage